All right. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jess Crejo with the Iowa Coalition for Integration and Employment and a member of your Employment First Leadership Team for Iowa. Welcome to the Iowa Community of Practice for March 2022. Really excited about today's presentation uh, and speaker. Before we, get pre uh, before we get started, let's take care of a couple housekeeping tasks. Thankfully, I hit record, so we're good there. Um, a shout out and thanks to Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services and the DD Council for their continued support and investment in the Iowa Community of Practice, um, collaborating uh, with the Iowa Coalition, um, as well as APSI for their continued support and collaboration on, on the Community of Practice as well. If you haven't already, be sure to mute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Today's session will be recorded and we'll be sure to share that. Uh, with the mailing list, along with any materials, the presentation, any tools, resources, links shared. We'll get that out to the mailing list. If you are not a member of the mailing list, just shoot me a quick email or have one of your team members do that and I'll get you added. What? Um, let me set my fellow colleague to mute. Awesome. Uh, closed captioning is available. And thank you to our captioner on today. Um, and thank you to the Georgia Institute of Technology um, and the Center for Inclusive Design for providing um, that level of accessibility for us and partnering with us on the captions. It's really important. Um, and so I think that is it. Um, so keep yourself muted. Be sure to share any questions, comments in the chat. Uh, when we open it up, feel free to um, unmute yourself and and share your questions and comments. Nancy and I really wanted today to be um, interactive and conversational um, as we talk about uh, the first in a two-part series, by the way, um, an integrative approach to job development. Um, so let me first introduce you to Nancy and then let me talk to you a little bit about why we wanted to talk about this topic and kind of why we're framing it the way we are. Um, but I, Nancy Brooks Lane is um, my friend and mentor. She works for Griffin Hammes Associates um, and she's doing wonderful work all across the country around systems change, um, customized employment, uh, job development, developing social capital, uh, building communities, um, civil rights work, right? Um, and disability, um, you name it, Nancy's done it. And uh, she's a great partner and a great coach. Um, and so we're really lucky to have her with us today um, as she just left a community of practice in Virginia to come join us. So that's really exciting. Um, and so again, Nancy and I thought about, you know, we were talking and kind of brainstorming what topics um, and the feedback that we got both from the community of practice and then from kind of the larger employment community, supported employment community from professionals, right? And even um, feedback that was garnered through APSI, right? At last year's retreat and kind of ongoing conversations were around this idea of, you know, whether it's job development, um, employer engagement, business engagement, business development, right? We kind of use all these different words interchangeably, right? That was definitely a need or an area of interest but then also something else that we picked up from that was professional sharing, both kind of from a personal perspective and a professional perspective of maybe feeling like a little out of control. Like, you know, they, they're not feeling like they're controlling their certain or their current um, environments and situations as like job developers and employment specialists, right? And that can look a lot of different ways. Some of that was tied to staffing. Some of that was tied to workload, caseload. Um, some of that was tied to maybe not feeling like I don't know how, what approach to take, right? And somebody that I'm supporting or if I'm supporting somebody with a more complex life or more complex support needs, right? What, do, what does that look like? What do I do? Um, and people sharing that they're just trying to create a, a work-life balance and um, maybe feeling burnt out worried that they might fail, right? They don't wanna let anybody down. 
um, and really working hard to try to get that business buy-in, right, and engage employers. So that's kind of where Nancy and I were coming with today, coming from today and kind of the frames our conversation. And I also want to say that in that, you know, we wanted to, I pulled up this quote um, and Ashley Lance had shared this quote recently with me and with a, a group of people, a group of professionals around, you know, I'll just read the quote to you. Your most desperate need is to be known and accepted then you can stop performing and stop living, right? And, and we were kind of talking about this quote as it, within the framework of thinking maybe of job candidates, right? Or those we support, right? And the need to be acknowledged and accepted as they are, um, that their personal genius, if you will, right? Is, is seen and celebrated and highlighted. Um, but I also kind of thought about this in terms of ourselves, right? As as employment professionals, as, um, you know, kind of regardless of our title or, or our role as, as job lead or job developer or program lead or job coach, whatever it is, right, that we too have a, a desire to uh, be known and accepted and, and kind of our current experience, right, in the field, um, be acknowledged and our work be acknowledged and the barriers and opportunities that exist for us, right? Also be acknowledged and discussed. So that's kind of where Nancy and I are coming from today. Uh, we want to, um, we want to, you to know that you're known and that you're accepted and seen and that, um, you know, that the, some of the struggles and challenges that you're encountering right now in your work, we hear that. And um, we wanna to try to talk about specific strategies today um, and what that could look like to hopefully uh, support you in your work um, and help you create that better balance and, and maybe um, start to eliminate or push back that fear, uh, right? Of failure, of, of not knowing what to do. Um, so I think then without further ado, I'll, I'll switch slides, Nancy, but know that we don't necessarily have to start here. Um, and I think I'll hand it over to you, Nancy Brooks Lane, if you would like to talk a little bit about yourself or your work. Um, but I know that oftentimes when you talk about yourself, you talk about um, your work in civil rights. And I, I, I was hoping we could maybe talk a little bit about how employment is a civil rights issue. Um, or why do you describe your work in that way? And maybe why we should do the same. Oh, and you were on mute, friend. <laughs> that is dear to my heart. I grew up in Mississippi and saw the horrors of what can happen when people are treated as other. And that has been a common thread throughout my career path. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, is just quickly move through um, the slide here and then I want to share with you a little bit about why why I do think of and many many people do um, and it is it's just a fact that disability rights is civil rights I am so sorry to tell you I'm going to take my video off um, and uh, my my internet is kind of wavering I live on a farm outside of Atlanta and it's going to rain and then someone else <laughs> is also on Zoom. So I do not want to get kicked off and put y'all through that. So I'm going to be um, prudent here, <laughs> but I'll come back at the end. Um, so I just wanted to start with the values because that's that truly is where uh, we have to be grounded. We have to use those values as yardsticks for decision making. Um, sometimes it's not so clear. And if you can go back to your values to check out if uh, what what the issue is um, fits with a person centered approach, then then that is important. If it doesn't, though, then it's important to be aware that uh, there needs to be more thought put into uh, what is being considered. Um, so, uh, and Jess, with my vision, I can't see. <laughs> that can you make it a little bigger 
All right. So person-centered approaches focuses on the individual's unique interests and preferences. Um, builds on strengths and high expectations for employment and career, focuses on creating individualized natural and creative community supports and less reliance on the service system. That gets to uh, normalization, which I'm gonna speak to in a moment. Um, power and control is with the person and their supports or allies. Uh, tailor supports to achieve the person's goals and future and aims for socially valued and inclusive employment and participation. I'm going to mention Wolf Wolfensberger, and that's right out of his, his work uh, to help us find a place of uh, being grounded in values. Traditional approaches focus on disability professionals, our service system viewpoint. We speak of person-centeredness, and this is organization-centric. We begin with a deficit and needs-based and low expectations that we've got to fix the person. Planning assumes the person's needs will uh, require. Um, power and control is what the professional's position is fits the person into the service available. And again, not what they need, not person-centered. And it limits the person to employment for people with disabilities or devalued work. It is not inclusive community integrated employment. And I am so sorry, I, uh, <laughs> for a moment, I thought it was going to leave me again. So you had asked about disability rights as civil rights. So we're gonna come back to this. We must use community and virtual tools differently and follow different rules of engagement. Um, so let me ground us in, in the disability rights piece that Jess started out with. Um, and then I want to come back to what does this statement mean? And I know, Jess, you've got thoughtful questions um, as we want to engage the folks. We don't want me just up here um, talking. So this, this is so uh, upsetting. In January of 2011, this statement was made by the director of an organization that supports people with disabilities. He's defending sheltered workshops. Persons with mental retardation are not normal and they never will be. Quit trying to make them something they are not. Isn't that sickening? And this kind of statement would not be possible without viewing individuals with disabilities as subhuman less than other. And we do that with many people in our culture often people who live in poverty, uh, people who don't look like the majority. Um, so when, when we identify individuals as other, then we treat them differently. We don't see them as worthy of the same qualities of life. And those qualities of life are grounded in um, you know, having relationships, having the same sorts of opportunities to connect, have valued roles, be included, um, to continue to learn, grow employment independence, um, and continuing to learn and give back and feel that you're valued. So, um, just one more piece to show that it was common for infants with developmental disabilities to be removed from their family shortly after birth and euthanasia of infants and children was allowed as late as the 1970s. And the American Journal of Psychiatry in 1942 notes, I believe when the defective child shall have reached the age of five, the case should be reviewed twice. If the medical board should decide that the defective has no hope of a future, is useless and foolish and entirely undesirable, then it is a merciful and kindly thing to relieve that defective of the agony of living. 
So the changes in all of this came about with the disability rights movement through the work of advocates and self-advocates. Congress passed many laws to support disability rights and uh, a strong, strong mantra of a group, nothing about us without us was adopted in the 80s and 90s. So all of the, this leads of course to um, the need for individuals with disabilities to have the same rights and to fight for that legally. Um, and one of the key players that shifted this was um, Wolf Wolfensberger with his principle of normalization, recognizing that people with disabilities deserve the same rights as people without disabilities. And social role valorization, which is critical, finding that valued role and that means that we enhance the individual's value by enabling them to find their contributions and to be a part of community. So that, that is why civil rights is disability rights. And of course, as um, laws have continued to be violated, um, especially laws of institutionalization, Lotus, Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson. Um, I'm, I'm aware that y'all have a DOJ um, uh, lawsuit uh, right now. Um, so that that is a part of probably, I think about 30 something states um, because Disability rights as civil rights is not actually embedded fully. And we have to continue to fight for that. So Jess, did you want to, um... oh, yeah. excellent question. Yes, thank you. You know, yeah, so I'm wondering, and I'm glad you brought up the DOJ report, right? Um, but I, it got me thinking, you know, when you were sharing some examples and, um, but anyway, what, what are some examples in our work, you know, in our day-to-day -day work where we see kind of that ableism or that low expectation um, kind of come to life in our work? Um, And this is the question to the group, correct? It is, it is. Um, I'm curious, yeah, I'm curious what others see or, I mean, I have some ideas and I, I, I you know, I think I know what I see and what I hear, but. Um... Anybody willing to? What happens when people are devalued? What does that mean for their life and their um, their daily needs being met? Um, Jess, this is Marsha. Hey, Marsha. Hey, I just had a, a meeting not too long ago where um, where someone went through a training program and and the um, provider was recommending the the, the, the on-the-job training unpaid on-the-job training through one of our local CRPs was completed and when we came back as a group including the family and this young man's parents we really had to um, help them understand that this was a successful event, that he learned some great skills, that, that while it was one-on-one -on -one training and it was only eight hours a week, it resulted in him learning what he, learning quite a little bit, and that that there are employers who need those skills and, and that the value 
would be there for his life for him to have a job, even though transportation is going to be tricky and supports need to be in place for it, even though social security has to be consulted and updated and will probably confuse things and be, <laughs> be difficult for, for them from time to time for one reason or another. And that um, it, was, it was one of my most recent times where instead of the family saying, you know, I want the most out of life for my child, it was, it's going to be easier if we just don't do this. And um, that was, that was an interesting perspective. It hadn't happened for a while, but it was very clear that um, I was asking them to have a little faith in the system that is there, that we can be successful and help him move forward. And that it is risky. It's not going to be perfect, um, but that we'll be there with him to help it go as smoothly as possible. I don't know. It was just a different, different conversation. Yeah. That's, thank you for sharing that. That, there's a lot of layers to that, I think. Um, yeah, I, I felt like I was like, okay, I can refer you all to some counseling and we need to do some advocacy stuff and right. we need to get some advocacy training for this young man just amongst his family and whew, yeah. Right, you know, and it, it makes me wonder, um, you know, because I think we all know, you know, the presumption is that families always come from the, you know, a place of like the utmost love and, uh, and concern, right? Um, yeah, but it makes you wonder what maybe what they have, what they have heard, um, about the person that they love, right. To kind of get to that place of, um, of maybe of such fear, probably fear and anxiety and, um, and quite honestly, yeah, a, a different kind of expectation, right. Um, Nancy, any thoughts on, on that, um. I love too, Marsha, the way you phrased that, um, you know, that there was, um, though there might be specific supports that need to be in place and um, some planning that needs to happen around transportation and benefits, um, that this, that work would bring value to this young man's life. And, um, It kind of actually yeah, made me think it, of it, right? Go ahead, Nance, go ahead. No, please. Continue, well, I was thinking Jess. of normal as, well, I was thinking of like normalization and just this idea of, you know, I understood what Marsha was describing, right? And I can imagine, um, right, some of the, the effort that takes place, right, to put certain supports in place. But I was just thinking like, you know, I have quite a few supports in place <laughs> that allow me to work. Um, and I have to do a lot of coordinating and finagling and, um, you right to, to make things happen. Um, and, you know, and I receive a lot of support to work, um, in lots of different ways, um, even tied to finances, right. You know what I mean? Um, so I was just thinking of my, my experience as, as an employee without disabilities, or that's how I would identify, right. But all the supports um and things in place that help me to work that allow me to work if you will yeah and i think somehow we end up judging individuals with disabilities who have some of the same needs that anyone has um or needs that uh equate to the fact that we all need one another at work or need supports at work um, and it, it seems to take on more significance when it's with someone with a disability as opposed to someone without. I don't know if that ties into what we're talking about, but it, but it came to mind. Um, mm -hmm. Just how we may look at um, individuals with disabilities who have those those needs 
uh, as something different than if it's someone without a disability. Does that make sense? It, it sure does to me. Um, it sure does to me. Yeah, because I'm thinking of even examples of, you know, like, uh, you know, I, examples of having a hard time with um, attention and focus, right? Um, and though, you know, some of us may carry a label of ADD or ADHD, maybe not, I don't know, but you know what I mean? We have, maybe we have some of those, um, those habits or those, those work supports that we need, right? That are kind of tied to those uh, behaviors, if you will, um, right? But if, but I'm not a person um, within the system, right? I haven't been labeled, um, so it seems more natural, um, right? If I do things that help me with my attention and focus, um, or if I don't follow through with something, um, I'm maybe not labeled or told I can't work. Um, it's just, right, I didn't follow through with it. Uh, what do you need to support you to be able to do that, right? Or what do I need to do different um, to make that happen, right? To follow through on the things that I've been assigned, for example. Um, or I know recently someone had shared an example with me of a young man who was exploring a personal relationship, a sexual relationship with his girlfriend, uh, adults, consensual, you know, all those boxes are checked, right? Um, but um, that behavior was framed as inappropriate and or uh, negative, even though it was absolutely normal and age appropriate and again, consensual. Um, but because uh, this gentleman lived in um, an institutional setting or a group setting um, and carries a number of labels and diagnosis, right, that, that completely normal behavior and exploration was um, labeled um, as deviant and, um, and, and it's actually keeping him from work right now, right? So the, the team decided that he cannot work because of this behavior. Um, and I think myself and the other colleagues that I was talking to about it were kind of chuckling because we were all like, well, gosh, a lot of adults would not be able to work <laughs> if their personal um, relationships or their conduct within those relationships was kind of brought to the forefront, right? Then we would all probably be labeled as inappropriate and deviant, most likely. Um, does that make sense, those examples? Um, I think that's what you're kind of getting at. At least that's what I'm getting at. Um, And there's another great comment. Oh, I see that now. Let me see. Yes. Oh, great. Okay, so Kara shared, I see a lot of families mindsets being they would pay the employer to hire their loved one. Educating families is key in getting their loved one paid at a competitive wage, not the other way around. Yeah. That's great feedback. And Nancy, um, Kara's uh, an APSI board member and a provider. She leads an employment services over in Dubuque. Um, and she also has a brother with a disability who works competitively um, in the community. And is honestly a rock star advocate <laughs> in the state too. So um, <laughs> very famous. Yeah, so that that's, yeah. Educating families is key. I, oh, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please do continue. Well, I love this. And Kara, I don't know if you want to talk about this or if anybody else wants to talk about it, you know, but I see a lot of comments come in, you know, when we're talking about like training needs or like support needs for job developers and stuff, people talking a lot about um, this need to educate businesses um, about disability and or about, you know, what we do. Um, yeah, I think, um, this is Kara. Um, Kara, I think a big, a big thing too, and it's prevalent is, um, the loved one is, you know, out to get a job and the family wants, you know, they got to shift their idea from volunteering or gosh, I I'll pay them to have him work because it's meaningful work, but also at the same time, it's, you know, pay them for what they're, they're able to do. And, and they are an employer. Um, to be able to work. Um, but at the same time, for a business perspective, we also have businesses thinking that the individual is working 
just to pass the time away um, because they've also said to us, you know, this is um, an agency is like, oh, that's awesome that he loves his job because he's making less on social security with this. Um, so we kind of do some educating, like, no, he's making, you know, so um, we just see a lot of benefits and, and education on, on businesses and, and that's not their forte, right? They shouldn't really know the ins and outs of um, integrated employment. That's our job to kind of step in and kind of give them a lesson one-on-one on, well, they're working, they're making money. They're also make you know, in addition to their, their um, supplemental income, but um, it's just shifting people's mindset that individuals with disabilities want to work and can work versus just to eat the time away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think this does tap into uh, kind of the rules of engagement. Um, and I'm just going to share a bit of info um, that's on my mind that it might be kind of ancillary to to the discussion, but I think it's important. And I think we have to begin thinking of ourselves as community builders and economic developers um, that we're helping solve the problems of business. Uh, We're increasing the employment rate. We're creating opportunities. And it starts by helping identify the interest and skill sets that are good fit for the individual. Uh, and from that, the person develops meaningful roles, meaning re- meaningful relationships. Um, and it goes back to that quote, um, Jess, about being able to contribute and be valued mm-hmm. for their contributions. And I think that means that we have to develop community-based methods, person-centered values, strengths-based, not deficit-based. We've got to use social capital. Well, we know the most powerful way to work is a team-based model. It's got to be outcomes-based, and we've got to support staff to succeed. Um, so if we can stay away from the disability model and the work that we do and um, focus on the needs of business after we focused on who the job seeker is, both uh, interest uh, and and skills um, in terms of task of a job, but also the culture. You know, sometimes we get it wrong. And I know I have in this work that I've done, I didn't think about the fact that uh, this individual really thrived around the social aspects of a business. And it's through that um, social side by matching them well that people can fit in and you don't have this, uh, it's kind of the same concept, Uh, someone who's working, being looked at as other because they have not integrated into the the business culture because it's not a good fit, just as if we had um, found a job for someone who who the tasks weren't a good fit for them. Um, and, And part of that has to be tied to how we engage with businesses. And through the work of uh, best practices and evidence-based practices, we work with small and medium-sized businesses. Um, And to be able to be effective in this way, we've got to spend more time in the world of business um, and, and think of ourselves as solving business needs. Um, so one way that I approach this is I, I stay away from jargon. Um, Doug Crandall and I, along with Abby Cooper and, and some other folks were a part of this focus group that we hosted and we hosted it in the Atlanta area. And it was with individuals uh, who were in leadership roles in businesses who had hired individuals with disabilities using customized employment methodologies. And what they said was, it, what, it, it's the employment specialist who got in the way. Um, and I've done this um, in the use of jargon. And so many folks, and I don't mean y'all, because Jess has already shared with me um, who y'all are and, and what a wonderful group of folks 
you are as the movers and shakers in Iowa. Um, but often folks don't know how to enter into that world of business. You know, they're still thinking about that they're caregivers working in a disability system. So in this new way of thinking about employment, it's got to be employment and community-based, not disability uh, specific. Um, so what I do is when I'm working um, and I'm first checking out businesses, I will say, you know, I'm um, uh, a, a career counselor and I help individuals find their career path, their interest. And again, you have to make sure it makes sense to who I'm talking to. Like a mom and pop shop, I would talk, or someone who's, who's older, um, I would speak in a way that fit with um, how they view the world and how they speak about employment. Um, but in this case, this is what I often use. Um, and then I'm working with someone who has a similar interest to what your business mission is um and i would love for them to be able to meet you and talk to you they're they're in the process of making decisions about the work they want to do and um if it would be possible you know we'd love to come in and just learn more about your business uh, what's important to you what what are your uh, headaches because we love to know more and more about community businesses and how we can find ways to be supports because we're part of the economic development of a community. And if they ask, well, where do you work? Then I go into uh, where I work and that we see work as a viable option for everybody. And, and it's grounded in research. Again, if that fits, not everybody's going to be moved by that. So you have to make sure that you're speaking uh, in, in the language uh, and the topics that fit that type of business. But it's important to listen to businesses uh, and research them before you go in to find out what, what are they about um, and to ensure that we spend more and more time in community and less time in disability systems. So all of that is to say that we have to have a presence in the community. We have to fit into the community. We have to connect in those ways that are tied to uh, the typical uh, business um, aspects of connecting and having a presence and getting to know one another as opposed to just waiting in the wings uh, and, and thinking of ourselves as part of the disability uh, industrial complex, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and, and pointing out how the work we do, because we do this excellent work of matching well job seekers to the needs of businesses. Um, and that's how we are able to be a part of solving business needs and, and the hiring issues in a community. Yeah, and we know, right, hiring, you said hi, you left off on hiring needs, right? We know um, how epic that workforce shortage is, right, across all kind of all industries right now. Um, and Nancy, too, I really appreciate, you know, that you're sharing some of the language and words that you use around um, that economic development approach, if you will, um, right? Solving business needs, solving business problems, um, uh, you know, uh, right? Career counselor, career paths. Um, oh, needs and expanding versus, um, you know, having conversations about needs and expansion versus openings and jobs. Um, I think that was kind of something else that we talked about, right? Like that the conversation looks maybe different. Because um, the other piece of this is, Nancy was kind of alluding to, right, that informational interview approach, right? This idea of 
having a conversation um, and asking for advice with, with a business or a manager or an owner, right? With a similar interest to the job candidate. Um, and I think that's a little bit different of approach than maybe we normally use in an informational interview, right? Or um, does anybody want to talk about that or speak to that? Am I, am I tracking that correctly? I know sometimes when we talk about informational interviewing or that approach in customized employment, I get feedback from folks that, you know, that's different than the informational interview approach that I use now or kind of what it looks like now for them. Is that true? Does anybody want to share a little bit about that? Because um, that was kind of one of my questions was, you know, is that approach kind of different than the approach you're using now? Um, and how comfortable, you know, how comfortable are we with kind of coming at it in that way versus um, from a disability perspective or from like an agency perspective with our agency hat on, I guess. Yes, would it be okay if I gave two quick examples yeah. of what, um, what we're talking about with that? Please. Um, yeah. So working uh, um, in Florida uh, with a, a person who had gone through this work we do into mentoring and he and I had a good connection, he contacted me and uh, he was working with someone who loved uh, puzzles. That was just, his passion and so we struggled through thinking um okay is that an interest <laughs> in, a, mm -hmm. in terms of how we spend our time when we're not working or could that move into an area where he could make money off of the skill sets i mean he just had this great spatial ability to connect shapes and and so as we began to work in, with the team we just explored and there's this beautiful synergy that comes about when you work as a team member. And we were trying to think, okay, where in the world of work do you fit pieces <laughs> together to make a whole? And to make a long story short, we came up with so many different great ideas, but someone said mosaics. Florida does all these um, outdoor uh, mosaic flooring and pools and things like that. And so when we also asked, well, does anyone have any connection to someone? Uh, one of the members, best friends, best friend owned this tile shop. So during the informational interview, they hit it off beautifully because they both love this whole notion <laughs> of creating beauty by fitting pieces together. Yeah. And it was just a perfect fit. And the other thing that was so, um, uh, such a great fit for this person is that the mosaics have to be fit uh, upside down and not everybody would have that skill set. So uh, that, that was the piece of how we looked at that differently. When you start with who the person's interests are and you spend time getting to know small and medium-sized businesses based on almost a discovery process as well to make sure that they are a good fit um, and you bring them together, they bonded immediately because of this common interest. And just real quickly, another uh, way this can look when we do informational interviews, uh, one person had um, a uh, interest in laminating and his parents bought him laminating machines upgrades every year at Christmas. And, you know, I'm going to be real quick because I see our time is, is moving quickly. Um, and uh, my thought was, you know, does laminating happen? And that's because I'm not the genius in laminating. We had to go to where the genius is. <laughs> so when we met with a small business in Austell, Georgia, um, we asked about, you know, what's your biggest headache? Because they, they did uh, have uh, laminating uh, services. That's when we went there. And they said, we are spending $3,000 a month to take products to Atlanta to have them laminated. And so to make a long story short, um, 
working with VR under tools and equipment and some uh, a union, a uh, communication workers of America, we were able to blend funding. He was able to purchase an industrial laminator that he owns because it's resource ownership, like mechanics bring tools to their job or chefs bring knives. Well, Wes brought an industrial laminator that he um, owns. And it created economic development because in the small town, people had to wait an unusually long time to get their laminated products. This way, they bring it in one day, they can have it the next, if not that day. Um, so this new resource was brought into this town. Um, it enabled Wes to have a job because uh, they're saving $3,000 a month. And Wes's salary was not three thousand dollars a month so they're saving money um so that's just a quick way how we engage businesses listening to them um researching the business to the extent that we can and learning more about what their needs are to the same extent that we learn about a job seeker Right, because we're using the same skills, right, that we're using with the job candidate, right, to build that rapport and um, get to know them. I think that's okay. interesting too, right? It's that one-to-one -to -one too, right? You know, just this idea of, yeah. Absolutely, starting with the person's interest. Um, and I think that's, that is um, tied to how we've got to think differently. Um, it's got to be community-based, person-centered, one business, one person, um, strengths-based, using social capital, who knows anybody, who knows anybody, um, and also looking at how to create those opportunities that don't exist by listening to the business owners knowing who the job seeker is and and making a good match and you know you you touched on something too that got me thinking about you know this idea of well what if i live in a rural community and we don't we don't have a lot of business businesses in my community or we don't have a lot of businesses with signs um or you know my team and i um you know we're pretty well connected in town right we've got we've got good relationships going um with what we perceive as all of the employers or most of the employers in town you know so maybe there's a, a concern about maybe like over utilizing business or over saturation right these ideas um you know what does that how does that interface with this approach or this idea right of the connecting with a business one-on-one -on -one or more authentically. Um, any, any thoughts on that, Nancy, about, so what yeah. if I live in, what if I live in a, in a rural community and it feels like, or it seems like there's not a lot of business here, a lot of opportunity. Right, in many cases, I've worked on a, a grant called Rural Routes to Employment. And what we found was because many times in small communities, there are so many opportunities for growth and, and uh, helping the community become more viable from a business standpoint. And uh, a great example is um, this gentleman who had these amazing computer skills using this old school equipment. He had been bullied and he found a way with this really old computer equipment to create these animated um, videos about bullying. And so we were thinking, just imagine what he could do if he had the right equipment. So uh, we, we did not know this gentleman, uh, but he had this whole media uh, business. When we Googled him, he gives back so much to the community. And that is a great sign that someone's going to have the values we are looking for because they care. And so when we introduced him to the gentleman who uh, we were supporting to become employed, again, if people are grounded in interest, they're already a step ahead because of bonding. 
And so um, when we were um, having just a conversation, uh, just finding out about what his business was, what were his needs, what were his headaches, um, and because he was kind of one of those people highly um, regarded in the community, we were able to ask about, you know, more of what is business like in this community in terms of growth and opportunities that he was aware of. So anyway, as we began working, he, he identified uh, a role he could take on as mentor to this gentleman. And so he helped us figure out what additional training would be beneficial in terms of his interest. He was able also in, uh, to pinpoint the skill sets that he had in terms of this whole arena of technology-based work. The other piece is when we asked him what, you know, what tools or equipment uh, would be beneficial because that's the resource ownership piece we talked about. He talked about a 3D printer that in the small town, they had nothing like that and it could create opportunities for additional revenue uh, and, and to be part of that economic development because this would solve some of the needs of the, the uh, community. And so we were to work out through VR that this gentleman was able to purchase a 3D printer. He owned the equipment, actually it's in VR's name until after I think uh, two or three years and then it's turned over. But just like tools and equipment that we're used to VR purchasing for individuals, um, that's how this was viewed. And so he was able to have the responsibility of uh, the 3D printer um, business that came in, as well as additional tasks that this gentleman needed because he was so busy. He was the only uh, media uh, based person that included marketing as well as um, all the the ways that advertisement is used, um, etc. So again, it created a, an economic resource, solved the problem of a small business owner, and enabled this gentleman to be hired and become a expert in this area that he loved of technology. You might be muted, Jess. Oh, I was whispering. I should not do that. That, yeah, that's a really cool story. <laughs> well, and it makes me think of, um, let me see if they're on Ashley or Kathy. They are not on. So, okay, I'll sing their praises. Ashley and Kathy out of Jefferson, Iowa, working out Imagine the Possibilities, were, they were working with a young man. Um, it was specific to discovery, but they were kind of brainstorming because this, this young man um, had an interest, a passion for welding, but had never had any formal training. Um, had done some welding like in high school through shop and, and whatever, um, but also lived in a very small town, like less than a hundred, um, less than 200 maybe even. So anyway, um, they were racking their brain about who do we connect them to either a person or a business tied to this welding because none of the, the larger companies in or around town would accept him because he didn't have that formalized training, right? That schooling or, you know, certificate in welding, whatever it was they were looking for. Um, so they were trying to like rack their brain, rack their brain. Who do we know? Who do we know? And they remembered that, through their previous employer, um, another provider agency that they worked for, um, that there used to be this man that they, um, that would essentially do maintenance for them and uh, welded and, um, and kind of could do that whole thing. They remembered him and, and remembered that he has a business in town. He, this is what he does for himself. This is how he makes a living, but he actually has no sign on the building, right? He, he's not you know, a public and obviously not a big corporation. Uh, so they're like, oh, that's it, right? So they reached out to him. They got this young man connected to him. 
uh, fast forward to he still works for him. Um, he's been able to mentor him and teach him new welds, new techniques, in addition to that, to his existing skill sets. And then the need for this man was that he was working too much. He wanted to work less. He kind of wanted to go into semi-retirement and pull back. Um, and then he was able to do this because this young man came on and kind of took, took on those skills and tasks and stuff that he needed uh, to get done so he could kind of back off a little bit. Um, so, so I think that that story is really cool because it, it, to me, it, it personifies or embodies a lot of things. They, they work together as a team to brainstorm that. Um, they started or were grounded in, in Jacob's interests, right? So this interest in welding, that's where they started from. Um, and then they started to rack their brain right on their, their capital, right? What's the connection? Who do we know or who's somebody that knows somebody? And that's kind of how they came up with this, this man. Um, and again, it was a small business, a business without a sign um, that you probably wouldn't come across or normally think of, right? Unless they were kind of brainstorming in the way that they, that they were. Um, and then again, it met his needs. Um, and then now this young man who uh, prior to this really didn't have a mentor and didn't really have any connections, any family connections to speak of either, right? Has this great mentor. Um, this great champion, this great friend, um, in addition to having an employer and a really solid paycheck, a really great paycheck. So, um, so I, I love that story and I'll, I'll end on that since we're at 156 already, somehow. Jess, would it be okay if I ended on just a little bit about social capital? Please, please, that would be great. That would be great. Okay. Great way to take us so, out. So to me, one of the most powerful aspects of this work that really lead to good outcomes is, is social capital. And of course, it's found in friendships, our networks, neighborhood, if we're spiritual, where we, we worship or come together, um, clubs, uh, where we work, uh, where we go out and spend time when we're not working, um, all of those areas where we have the opportunity to connect with other people. And it's important because social capital is part of how we connect in the world of work. And in our own lives, we are social beings. We cannot do very much without one another. And often job seekers don't have the opportunity to create social capital. Social capital leads to employment opportunities and and opens doors. Uh, if we're connecting people around interest, it already creates the opportunity for those individuals to develop a relationship. So uh, a couple of ending points of, of how we need to help individuals with disabilities develop those social connections. Um, and, and of course it starts with, you know, helping the person make choices um, and identify their skills, interests, preferences, strengths, create opportunities for the person to talk to and connect with those who um, are in those areas. Where do people hang out with the same interest? Um, those sorts of things. And, and the work we do, we need to incorporate opportunities for people to connect with others in, in whatever we're doing with the individual every day. You know, we run into people all the time and, and uh, looking for this opportunity to, opportunities to build those community relationships. Um, helping the person locate places where people hang out uh, with those interests and um, helping the person to be in those spaces over and over and over again. We can't develop connections and it could be virtually or um, as COVID gets better, it could be uh, in person. But where do those people hang out who have those interests and the person be able to be in those spaces with them over and over again? And it is through those relationships that we can build opportunities. That's how we work. That's how we operate. And for organizations, I think what's important is to um, look at how 
when we write grants or connect around funding um, to integrate building social capital into each other's, uh, each other, meaning the individuals you get to support, a uh, support plan, then it involves into practice. It helps facilitate the individual to develop those relationships, enhance those, and it becomes um, identified as important. It is those relationships that are the most powerful piece to opening doors for individuals. And it's got to be reciprocal. It can't be that we're just asking for. It's got to be also finding ways to help the individual give back. That gives them meaning. It gives them a valued role. Um, so I just wanted to, to stress that as well. Um, gosh, we could go on and on and on with all of these topics. <laughs> <laughs> um, for quite a while. So I hope I haven't been too uh, brief uh, and that the points I was making are clear. But um, if I had to say the things that I find most powerful in this work we do, I would say helping people build their own social capital, using the social capital of our, um, our lives and coworkers and people uh, in the individual's families, anybody who knows somebody who can help connect the person around their interest. And then informational interviews where we are matching well who the person is. We get to know the business um, just as well. I mean, of course, we don't do a, <laughs> any kind of uh, profile on the business, uh, but we spend time getting to know who they are. And there are um, informational interviews questions that get to that, such as what's your biggest headache? Uh, what product or service do you want to expand into? Um, what are you most proud of? And, and um, on and on. And I have so many examples yeah. um, that we just don't have the time to go into that illustrate exactly what I'm talking about, how helping the person to connect with individuals with the same interest led to them becoming employed. Are developing a mentorship because some folks were school age. Right. Well, and I think though that's a perfect segue into I'm gonna stop our recording real quick.